Uh, uh, welcome tonight. Um, my name is Sloan Shoemaker. I'm the Executive Director of the Wilderness Workshop. Um, we're very excited to have Dr. Tony Chang here for tonight's presentation um, in this uh, next uh, installment of Naturalist Nights. Naturalist Nights is um, a collaborative effort between the Wilderness Workshop, Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, and the Roaring Fork Audubon Group um, to bring important topics of ecological significance to the valley. Um, and part of our mission as an organization is to help sort of improve the ecological literacy um, of our community and, and this, this goes a long way towards doing that. So we're really pleased tonight to, um, to have you here and to have Dr. Tony Chang. Um, Naturalist Nights, quick commercial uh, break. Naturalist Nights is sponsored by a bunch of people and, and we're really pleased to have these sponsors. Um, Alpine Bank, um, Aspen Snowmass Ski Company, Finbar's Irish Pub, Gorsuch, St. Moritz Lodge, Days Inn, Harry Teague Architects, Reese Henry and Company, Two Leaves in a Bud Tea Company, Carol Dobkin Real Estate, Sterling Homes, Ken Ransford PC, and the Ute Mountaineer. Um, we couldn't do it without them, and very, it's really nice that they help us out. Um, so thank you to our sponsors. And we uh, march, um, we're, we're nearing the end of the series for this year. Um, the, the upcoming uh, presentations will be um, on March 21st, uh, Climate Change and the Future of our Rocky Mountains, kind of a significant topic, uh, by Ian Billick, the director of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab over the hill in Gothic outside Crested Butte. Pikas and climate in the American West. Um, with pika is a is a is a indicator species um, for how climate change is affecting um, our alpine area, uh, our areas. Really fascinating research on that. And then lastly, there'll be the American Dipper as an indicator of river health. The American Dipper is a cute little bird that bounces around on rocks on rivers, and you see him diving into the water, so I'm hunting bugs. Uh, so it's a great lineup coming. Please do uh, please participate in those. It should be good. Um, now I'd like to introduce Tony. Um, Tony's one of my heroes. I, I, uh, in my other life as, as, the, as the president of the Colorado Bark Beetle Cooperative, um, I really look to people like Tony to help ground the discussion about forest health and the bark beetle epidemic and, and how communities can work together in a collaborative fashion to address um, the impacts of the bark beetle outbreak in a way that's well grounded in the science. And that's what Tony does, and that's what the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute does, is, is to help bring science um, to these discussions, the community discussions about um, forest management, forest health, and, and in our interface as communities that are embedded in these forest ecosystems that evolve over time and have natural disturbances like bark beetles and fire, um, help, and if our conversations aren't well grounded in the science, it's kind of pointless to be having those conversations because we're going to end up doing things that, um, that make no sense ecologically and could have um, pretty significant blowback, um, like we saw with Smokey the Bear, who told us that we should eliminate all fire from the forest, and we're finding out that that wasn't such a good idea after all. So bringing science to bear through the work that Tony does at CFRI, the Restoration Institute, is, is critical to uh, making good decisions um, as a community about our relationship to the National Forest. Tony's been the uh, director of the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute since 2005, is that right? Eight. 2004, two, eight, yeah. I gave you a promotion there. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's a professor of rangeland and uh, forestry and rangeland stewardship at CSU down in Fort Collins. Um, and his interest is really to, uh, to, to the, the intersection of forest governance, of policy, planning, um, collaborative work, and participatory strategies that uh, sustain resilient forest ecosystems and the well-being of forest-reliant communities. And forest-reliant communities is a, can be broadly defined. It doesn't necessarily mean communities that rely on removing wood from the forest and selling them somewhere. It also means communities like ours that are reliant on the, um, the, the, our relationship to the National Forest and all it provides in terms of water, clean air, clean views, vistas, uh, abundant wildlife for, um, for hunting and angling and um, recreational opportunities. So we are as dependent on the forest and, 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 um, and, and it's being in a healthy condition as um, you know, a timber-based community. So um, Tony's been really helpful in, in sort of framing and the, that conversation um, throughout Colorado. So that's enough out of me. I'd like to introduce Tony. Excellent. Dr. Chang. Thank, Thank you. you. 
I'm gonna dig up. I had a prop here that I I gotta remember to. Here it is. Oh yeah, thanks. I'm gonna pass around a sheet just to get your name and contact information so that we can keep you in abreast of uh, further new new presentations and and opportunities um, like this. Okay. No other logistics. Okay. This this fine. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, it's a great. Um, it's always a great thrill for me to get get out and about and talk to very different audiences. I, I hang around with um, uh, kind of the the say what I call the STPs, the same thirty people. <laughs> Sloan's one of those thirty. In fact, he's tea cows for two. So. Uh, but I want to start, I'm going to cover a very wide range and I'm going to blow through a lot of uh, information um, because it's always a challenge to sort of know the, the, the degree of, of knowledge, of resident knowledge in a, in, a, in a broad audience like this. But I want to start off with, with a story of this picture. This is, uh, this is in the Boat Creek drainage. Boat Creek drains um, into the, um, the North Platte River just on the other side of the Colorado border in, into Wyoming. So it's just far southern Wyoming. And, uh, and, and in the background, you can see uh, very high levels of mortality from the mountain pine beetle. These are all lodgepole pines that are all dead. And then kind of a sprinkling of a variety of, of other species, uh, but most of those are lodgepole pine. Um, and in the foreground here, it's, it's kind of a wide meadow, and you have some aspens, and then you have this tree. This is a ponderosa pine. When we think about ponderosa pine, we don't think of them living in a lodgepole pine-dominated system. This lodgepole pine is, uh, is, is about 380 years old. It is a relic of a climatic condition that uh, was unique to what's called the, the, um, the medieval warming period. And then after the medieval warming period, we saw a huge influx of cooler and moister forest species that now are dying off. And yet, here's this guy, at least twice as large as any of the other trees around it. Wait, that's a large polar pine. That, this, is, this is a ponderosa. Okay, it's about 8,200 feet. It's about the, in, in, in Colorado, that is an a, a, a unusually um, high elevation to find uh, ponderosa pines. Okay. So, I, so uh, this is, one of the lessons I want to sort of impart on you is that, that we have to think about forests and change in very long time periods because trees and forests live for very long uh, uh, time periods, uh, 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 centuries typically. Okay. So I'm going to come back to this, uh, uh, to this, this picture and this tree in particular. Um, but before I do, I'll, I'll do a little self, shameless self-promotion. Um, as Sloan mentioned, I'm the director of the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. Uh, it, it, it's actually a program that was chartered by Congress in 2004 in response to some very uh, unusually um, uh, severe wildfires here in the West, in the Southwest, uh, all across uh, the Rocky Mountains. And there was a, a clarion call that a lot of what uh, forest managers and, and sort of what we as a forestry community were doing um, really wasn't uh, really needed to account for fi a greater understanding of fire and disturbances in setting um, uh, forest management plans. We're located at Colorado State University. There's also an institute at Northern Arizona, the Ecological Restoration Institute. And there's one at the University, uh, New Mexico University of Highlands. Um, and uh, our, our job is really to, to develop, compile, and apply current scientific knowledge to help define and achieve forest restoration goals and uh, fi fire hazard reduction. And so it's really a fire-oriented, but also forest restoration. Uh, we're a fairly small staff. I just just um, hired, uh, had a big turnover. Have I have three staff, uh, and then myself. 
And so we can't really do a whole lot without collaborating with others. So we do a lot of collaborative work with scientists, other scientists at other institutions, uh, resource managers and a broad range of stakeholder interests uh, ranging from uh, conservation oriented to local government to uh, forest products companies uh, really to to work on these restoration and wildfire hazard reduction goals there's a, there's a there's a big common ground there and really kind of in, in thinking about what what it is that we actually do is we really try to inform the conversation about why when, where, and how to do the most effective restoration and, and hazard re reduction work with limited resources, okay, with limited financial, human, and technological resources. So given that limit, where are those places that really warrant uh, those kinds of treatments to get our forests back on track? Okay. So I want to frame this conversation with a, a, a general principle that's generally regarded as true is that forest change and and right now in colorado and in the in the west uh, uh extending from british columbia all the way down through mexico uh, we are seeing lots of changes at the same time uh, we, we are seeing unusually large uh, and severe Wildfires, fires that are burning uh, in size and in severity that we had that that isn't recorded in human history, nor is it recorded in ecological history. And the Hayman fire uh, that burned uh, just southwest of Denver in 2002 is a is sort of a case study in that. Uh, there was another fire uh, uh, in southwestern Colorado called the Missionary Ridge Fire that probably would have got all the headlines if it wasn't for the Hayman fire. Of course, here in the high country, uh, we have the, a mountain pine beetle infestation uh, that's extending from, uh, from Colorado all the way up into northern British Columbia. Uh, a little further south of here, we have a, a bark beetle, a, a spruce bark beetle. There's about five bark beetles uh, that, that are, that are um, native to conifer forests in the west that are infesting right now, that are in epidemic populations. It's called the synchronous infestation. They're all happening at the same time. And that's very, it's kind of like right now where Venus and Jupiter are kind of aligned. That's kind of how unusual that is. Uh, and and, and uh, for, for those of you who care about Aspen, we also have uh, some Aspen dieback that's happening. And so there's, there's a lot happening. There's a lot going on and there's a lot of people concerned as, as, uh, as they, they ought to be. Um, so I want to I, I, I want to try to uh, I organize the co my presentation to answer these three questions. How do we make sense of these changes? Like what's, what, what do we think is going on? And so I want to at least touch on some of the major pods of scientific research that's going on. Do any of these changes that are happening warrant any kind of human action? Okay, restoration is an intentional human endeavor, and so we, we make choices about what we choose to restore and, and what we choose to kind of let go. Okay? So how do we know? How do we know when, when a change warrants, warrants some kind of human action like restoration? If we do make a decision about restoration um, with such large areas and limited resources, how do we, so, how do we decide to, where to take those actions? Okay, and that's, that's sort of getting to the brass tacks. Okay. So I, I, have, I, I have a whole bunch of stuff that talks about um, how we might make sense of, of those actions. But before I want, I, one way, one couple of frameworks, a couple of big ideas to how, how we understand change, at least from the ecological sciences. So one way to understand change is this concept of resilience. Okay, and resilience is, the, here's the definition of that, is the amount of shock an object or system can absorb bef before it starts behaving differently. Okay, and so here, here's, my, here's my prop. Okay, so how many of you play racquetball or, or have played racquetball or have ever hit a racquetball? All right, racquetballs, they're tough mofos, right? They can, they can take a beating, right? What, what, what is it about a racquetball that allows it to absorb shock? What is it about it? It's tough. Okay, why is it tough? Um, it's atomic structure. Okay, what, t tell me about the atomic structure. What is it composed of? Uh, 
rubber. What else? Air. Air inside the rubber. So there's there's a there's a physical and a chemical properties of it, and also round spheres are incredibly incredibly resilient. Okay. So what would it take to change? the behavior of this racquetball. What would we need to do to this thing? Punch a hole in it. You'd have to be a big hole. We could cut it, and it would no longer behave like a racquetball. What else could we do? Burn it. We can melt it. Okay, so we can apply a lot, we can apply a lot of energy and force to a racquetball in order to make it do some, to, to behave not like a racquetball. Okay? But it would, it would require a lot of energy to do that, okay? <laughs> so, all systems have the capacity to absorb shock before they start behaving differently. And, and, and it, the, the, a system's resilience depends on two things. First of all are the properties and processes, right? the chemical, physical, and biological properties and processes of the racquetball allows it to absorb a lot of, a lot of shock. Okay? But there's a limit to that. And when it crosses, it, crosses, it reaches that limit, we, it, we, we talk about crossing a threshold that it starts behaving differently. Okay? It also depends on the shock. Right? The, that, that some shocks completely overwhelm a, a, a system or an object's ability to absorb that shock and still behave the same way. Okay? So how many, right, how, many, how many times can this guy get slugged before he starts acting differently? Right? But it also depends on what you consider normal behavior. Right? Okay, so we can pretty much objectively talk about what would be a normal behavior for a racquetball. We have a little bit of a harder problem defining what normal behavior is for a human being. And we even have even a harder time defining what is normal behavior for something as complex as a forest ecosystem. Okay. But, but I'll tr we'll, 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 try to, we'll try to put some parameters around sort of this notion of normal uh, system behaviors. Okay. Here's another concept of how we might understand change. Okay, how we might put some boundaries on it, some parameters around it. Uh, I, this is a great GIF file that I, I was able to download. I love the internet. You can find all kinds of crap on it. Uh, but this comes from a, um, a, a systems uh, ecology theory called panarchy. And it was, uh, it was sort of coined uh, by, um, uh, uh, by Lawrence Gunderson and C.S. Hauling, Buzz Hauling at the University of Georgia, um, to really describe how si ecological and human systems change. Okay? And, and here is, is a great kind of graphic about sort of um, the cycles, the adaptive cycles of a forest system as, as uh, resources become available, um, uh, plants and animals exploit those resources. And as those resources get soaked up within that system, that system has a way of conserving them, right, in biomass, right? Trees are great at conserving energy from sun, water, and soils. But at some point, all systems go through some kind of release. There's some kind of shock that, that, that releases all of, those, all of that energy and then reorganizes into a whole another functioning system. The lesson here, the short answer here is forests possess properties that allow them to retain their normal structure and functioning within a range of disturbances. So you can do a lot to forests and they still are wired with biological, chemical, and physical properties to withstand a lot of disturbances. Okay? So for example, the Yellowstone Fire was really kind of a, a national sort of awakening about the role of fire in, in, in forest change and in forest ecosystems. There was a lot of people that were very concerned about that, right? And, there, and so there was a lot of uh, Tom Brokaw was there, all the big news networks were there, and the, sort of the after effects uh, looked, looked like it was just a horrible moonscape. Okay. Anybody remember that? 
in the, I mean, it was, it was in the news for a long time, and it really kind of, there was a lot of people that were thrown under the bus because of decisions they made to let the fire burn. But only a few years later, this is a picture that's about 10 or 11 years uh, after that, so that was about 2000, and, and most of those areas are now flush with new trees. Okay? That is, in, in many ways, and, and the work of one of my colleagues, Bill Rami, shows that uh, these, this is an ecological normal process of change for lodgepole pine. They grow, they, they, they grow in great abundance, they burn, they burn, uh, they, they, they live fast uh, and die hard, <laughs> as, as Bill likes to say, and, and that's part of their cycle. Was that seeded or did that? No, this is all, this is all natural. Itself. Yeah, and one of the things about that is that lodgepole pines, their seeds are what, what are called serotonous cones, that they only release in the presence of high heat. And so they have to have fire to be able to even get the seeds out. So that's sort of one of the, that's sort of one of the, the things we're keeping an eye on with the mountain pine beetle is that there, there, is, no, there is no serotony event that will, that will release serotonous cones. Now, not all lodgepole pines are serotonous, and that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a, a nuance that I'm not going to talk about, but we can talk about it at the Q&A. I've been told I only have an hour for the community TV show, so I have to kind of keep moving. So keep, 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 your, uh, keep your questions. Um, this, is a, this is a stand uh, down in, uh, in, in north, northern Arizona, but it's not unlike some of our Ponderosa pine stands, uh, where as a result of, of fire suppression and, and past forest management and, uh, and grazing has resulted in very dense um, stands of Ponderosa pine. Um, and so through mechanical thinning and prescribed burning, um, uh, uh, my colleagues at Northern Arizona uh, were able to release these native grasses and create conditions for more ecologically normal fires to burn. Lower, lower intensity, they're not going to burn hot like lodgepole pine. They're functionally very different kinds of systems, and I'll talk a lot about, more about that later. And so even with a heavy human hand, with mechanical uh, fitting and prescribed burning, uh, this, this forest has responded really well, really nicely. Now it it's can experience more normal fire regimes. Okay. The third way to understand change is it gets a little bit more detail into the ecology, and it's what we call historic range of variability. That, that ecosystems, their structure and their functioning have experienced why can experience a lot of change over time. Okay, and so just just uh, if you can sort of read this, um, that that HRV we call it HRV is is a way to understand the kinds of changes, the range of changes that for, forest ecosystems or any ecosystem goes through. The upper and lower bounds of, of these changes are set by the biological, physical, and chemical properties of that system. Okay? So we can actually probably do a graph of the range of change of a racquetball because of its, of its physical and chemical properties. The curve of the shape, the, right, the, the amplitude and frequency is determined by disturbance patterns, by the kinds of shocks. So is it hopefully these sort of three concepts, they're, they're interrelated, but they really sort of identify two or three major commonalities, right? These notions that every system have these properties by which they are able to self-organize in response to a disturbance, okay? I need some nods if I can, because I'll, I'll, otherwise I'll keep talking and because <laughs> I'm used to teaching students as well, so um, uh, usually I look for a couple students to go like this. Okay, so now on, I sort of want, now that I've established that, I want to move on to, okay, well, what kinds of disturbances are we talking about? Um, so in ecology, in, in, in forest ecology, uh, one of the things that we have to understand is this notion of a disturbance regime. And, and the disturbance regime is merely a set of patterns of disturbances that have shaped a, a system over time. Okay, and so there are four dimensions of a disturbance regime. Four things that define the pattern. One is the type of disturbance. 
Okay, so we have here a variety of disturbances that we typically see in Colorado, fire, insects, disease, human, wind, and avalanche. The size of the disturbance and the geographic distribution of those disturbances. So they can happen at the individual tree level, they can happen at, the, at, at a group of trees, or, and all the way up to ecoregions and even continental scales like we're seeing with the mountain pine beetle. Entire forest types being affected. Okay. And then the next two are, are really the frequent, how often do these disturbances occur? And when they do occur, how intense are they? Um, and so frequency, uh, sometimes they're annual. Um, uh, and and the, the, what, we, what we calculate as far as the frequency of a disturbance is what we call return interval. And it's not unlike, if you're familiar with like a, a, a flood plain, um, you know, 10 year flood, 50 year flood, 100 year flood, it's, it's, it's sort of like that as a probable, it's a, it's a probabilistic function, if you're into that kind of mathematics. Uh, but the return interval is actually a, uh, we can actually see that within tree rings. We can actually measure how often a, a forest has been disturbed by looking at evidence like tree rings. Um, and then intensity, how much energy is released when um, you do have a, um, a disturbance. Uh, so as, as you can imagine, the more frequent the disturbance, how much energy is, is released compared to an infrequent disturbance. Usually lower, right? Because you don't have enough energy built up in the system, right? Coming back to that figure eight circle, okay? So the more frequent a system's disturbed, the less energy is released. And so it, it's, it's a very sort of uh, fast cycle. Uh, the longer it, it, in between uh, disturbances, the more energy is gonna be released, okay? Again, from individual to what we call stand replacing mortality, big, areas of forests are being um, uh, uh, disturbed and, and dying. So what determines, what drives a disturbance regime? In Colorado, I'll focus on, on things that are in Colorado. Uh, there, are, there are three factors that uh, drive a disturbance regime. And, and one is, is what we call a top-down force. It's sort of these, these sort of mega, mega forces. The second is bottom up, and then the third is uh, whether you have a trigger for the disturbance. Okay. So the main top-down driver, the top-down control, uh, is climate, as you can imagine, and especially drought. Um, here is a, uh, so using tree rings, this is really cool, there's a, there's a whole field of science called dendrochronology, and they use tree rings to, to basically um, backcast rather than forecast to backcast climate. You can you can actually measure CO2 concentrations based on tree rings. You can measure the amount of precipitation and the variability in precipitation. We can't measure temperature because we can't record that in tree rings, but we can. But but based that, that, the, at least the the precipitation we can actually we can actually backcast. Um, droughts, climate, right, precipitation. Um, this is a PDSI, it's called Palmer Drought Severity Index. It's basically a, a, a calculation of, of, um, the, of how, of drought conditions over a mean period. And over this period is a 700 year mean period. So that's a pretty good time series. And so from that average, we can sort of see the minus is more severe drought and the, um, uh, the, the pluses are less drought or even non-drought conditions, okay? And so uh, this is the work by uh, 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 some, some folks down in, uh, uh, in Tucson. And uh, so we can sort of see patterns of drought and wet years going back 700 years. Pretty cool, okay? One of the things that we have to, one of the things that, that people re that really look at this data, and then the, these gray marks are sort of the, 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 the annual high points, okay? So this one right here, this was a really bad drought year. This was, this was the Dust Bowl. This was the Great Depression. This is 1933, right here. Bad, bad year. This is basically when all the crop, this is, right, John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath kind of stuff, okay? But, one of the marking points is, is about mid-1600s, 
earlier, to the, to even past the 1300s, one of the things that we see a lot more are what we call multi-decadal droughts. Droughts that lasted, look at this, look at, look at how many decades this drought lasted. Okay. And compare that with relatively recent history, which is actually pretty wet. And if actually there's, there's reconstructions of, of droughts going back even further by taking logs, like for example, the excavation up at Snowmass. Uh, there, there is now, the, uh, my colleague Peter Brown has about two dozen logs from that Snowmass excavation. And he's, he's, he's actually gonna do some dendrochronological work. And all those trees are Douglas fir. Douglas fir is a warm, dry, conifer species. What's there right now, generally? Yeah, yeah, a cool, wet species. So this is going to be really cool to see what they can come up with with, uh, with those 15,000-year-old um, trees. Okay. Um, I, I want to put this here because <clears throat> this is a time of human uh, active fire suppression. This is when the Forest Service, the federal government, made huge investments into stopping fire as a disturbance regime, especially here in the West. So that's, a, that's an important story for us. And we can actually see it. This is, uh, no, this is um, uh, this, these are number of fires that occurred uh, by Tom Sweatman, again, down in the Southwest, so uh, within our geographic area. Um, these are in Ponderosa Pines. And that, as you can see, um, the, these are the numbers of sites recording fires back to 1700. This is a frequent fire regime, right? This is, this is, a, this is a ecosystem where fires burned every five to 15 years. And after 1900, this, this is what human fire suppression does to a fire regime. It basically knocks it out. So for a lot of these forests, we, up to 2000, we've disrupted probably five to 10 return intervals. And Think about all that energy that's building up in those systems waiting to be released in a big fire like we had last summer in, North, in the Wallow Fire in northern Arizona. Okay. So I want to get back to my, my fun tree up in southwestern Wyoming. My, my colleague Lori Huckabee up at the Rocky Mountain Research Station thinks that the establishment of this Ponderosa and others like it in this drainage come from this period. It, 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 it's on the back end of this multi-decadal drought where there's likely lots of fires, and then there was nice wet years, right? These really favorable conditions that allowed these guys to grow, or these gals to grow. And then as we get into the, seventh, uh, to the, ninth, the 19th and early 20th century, um, we start seeing cooler and wetter climate. That's where these lodge poles come in. Okay. So forests change. All right. Um, and, and, and more recently, uh, we, we have dis, uh, di regime disruption as a result of, of human settlement and land use from grazing that's taken out a lot of those grasses that allows those fires to burn at low intensity. We've taken out a lot of those fire resistant trees and we've suppressed a lot of fire. So I want to move to bottom-up controls, the things that, that, drive, that determine the kind of disturbances we see, but from the bottom up. And, and, and it's really uh, um, two major factors plus uh, another human factor. Uh, geography, latitude, elevation, aspect, soil type. And, and this, this graphic by Lori uh, really displays that really nicely, where as you go from lower elevations, like we have in Colorado from about 5,000 feet, as we move up to elevation, uh, those of you who spend a lot of time in the, in the forest probably see this, right? You move from uh, kind of a, a, a pinyon juniper uh, wood, woodland through ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, uh, lodgepole pine, uh, subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, up into, the, up into the alpine. Okay, so in Colorado, we have all of those. And, um, and so geography really determines that as well as the existing forest struct, uh, vegetation structure and composition. I'm gonna use structure and composition a lot. And what I mean by that, structure is basically the physical attributes and arrangements of plants. Fancy word for structure, okay? So the height, width, density, 
those kinds of things that you can actually go out and measure. And then the composition is the mix of plant species. Okay, so structure and composition. I'm going to use those um, as we move. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about these gradients uh, here in a little bit. Okay. So here's some examples of that, how forests vary in their structure and composition as, as a natural part of their functioning. Okay, so in ponderosa pines, typically wider spacing, right, low density. Um, the, the trees can get very, very large. Um, compared to a classic lodgepole pine, right? E very dense, even age, growing close together, skinny trees, okay? You've got, if you spent a lot of time in the woods, you've probably seen that. Uh, a lot of our, our, our mixed conifer kind of look like this, kind of a mumble jumble, very complex, very variable uh, uh, structure and composition. And, by, and, and this is kind of a picture of spatial arrangement where you have sort of low density, sparse, uh, almost meadow-like stands moving into more dense um, stands as you, as you hit a northern aspect. Okay. And then the availability of disturbance triggers. So you, in order to have a disturbance, you have to have something that, that's a triggering event. Uh, when we talk about fire, we talk about lightning as a natural disturbance event. Okay. Uh, most of our lightning strikes occur in the middle to late summer. This is sort of a uh, taken from July 11th. Uh, th these are sort of the prevalence of lightning strikes. This is actually, I, I, I sort of dug this up. This is, a, this is the average number of lightning uh, over about a 16 year period from 89 to 2005. So it covers a, a range of interannual precipitation years. And I, I know you guys get lightning here. Everybody gets lightning. But there are some areas in Colorado that get a lot of lightning, like a lot. And, and it's, something, it's something about Pikes Peak, the Pikes Peak monolith right here. This is Pikes Peak right here. That, that is just, it just generates lightning. There was a kid, there was like a 13-year-old kid that was killed by a lightning strike up there a few years back. Um, so there's something about this elevational gradient uh, where a lot of lightning occurs, and, and, this, and this right here is the Hayman Fire footprint. Of course, Hayman Fire wasn't started by lightning. It was started by human. And here, uh, this is just a website that I pulled out that talks about the, the growing problem of human starts, human fire starts. Um, I, I, I sort of made this graph for this presentation. Uh, the blue is number of fires in the western U.S. Uh, ignited by lightning, and then the red is the number of fires that were ignited by human. So we are a disturbance agent. We have altered, we have fundamentally altered the timing, location, and, and seasonality of disturbances. So if there's sort of one take-home message, it's, you know, Smokey gets beat up a lot. Uh, you know, poor Smokey. But if you think about Smokey, one of Smokey's original messages, it's put your campfires out. Don't play with matches. Right? Avoid being a part of this red part. And this is the number of acres burned as a result of, uh, of human starts. So anywhere uh, between, you know, a 30% to a, you know, 600% increase in fire. Do the red areas include prescribed burns or actually this is, this is all wildfire. So wildfire being, dis yeah, being distinguished from intentional control burn. Okay. And then, you know, this picture always gives me the creeps. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But uh, again, there are dozens of insects and disease agents that are native and endemic to western forests, including Colorado. So we have a whole bunch of them here. And, and drought and existing forest structure and composition combine to cause endemic populations to outbreak into an epidemic. Okay, so you have to have a confluence of drought plus the right vegetation conditions to get the kinds of bugs we see here. So there's the mountain pine beetle. Here's, the, here's our favorite uh, little bug here in Colorado. We should make them the, the state bug. This is the, this is the spruce bark beetle. Um, and, and, and does a lot of the same things, gets into the cambial layer and basically girdles a tree. This is a spruce budworm um, uh, that's, that's really taken out a lot of subalpine fur. Okay. 
So we have so so we have we have a way to make sense of change. We we sort of know now uh, about about these properties of of forests. We know about their disturbance agents. So what do we, what do we make of these changes? How do we interpret these changes? How do we do they warrant any kind of action? Do we need and and if so, where where do we do it? Okay. Okay. So forest restoration. It, it, from, our, from the Restoration Institute's perspective, is warranted when a forest system is losing or has lost essential properties that are resulting in undesirable or abnormal ecological characteristics and functioning. Right? When they're starting to behave like something else. Okay. This, is, this is a great picture. This is from the Hayman Fire uh, area. And, and, and this is the soil erosion that is occurring as a result of the Hayman fire. This is abnormal. The, these kinds of soil loss. So soil loss occurs, right? We know that, right? We know erosion occurs. But it doesn't occur at this rate and this volume because of the abnormality of the fire. It just, it, we know that from the background rate of, 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 of erosivity in those kind of decomposed granites. Um, and this is a restoration project not too far from that, uh, from the Hayman fire burn. Okay. Well, we can, so I'm going to put desirable, normal, ab undesirable, abnormal in quotes because there's a, we, can, we can sort of discern those through, e through ecology. There, 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 are, there are scientific ways to determine whether a system's out of that range of variability. And there's also human values that come into play, that there are also functions of a system that we as humans want to preserve. Okay. But we start making trade-offs uh, on the ecology if we try to put those controls too tightly. Okay. So, sort of move, so in thinking about restoration as both an ecological science endeavor as well as a human endeavor, a, a lot of our work really focuses on uh, working with place-based collaboratives. And, and so how I know Sloan is through the work of the Colorado Bark Beetle Cooperative that he had talked about. Uh, these are the four main ones that we work with in Colorado, but I want to note that there are many more groups, uh, collaborative groups, community-based partnerships, community wildfire protection initiatives. Uh, Colorado has a very high density of these forest-based collaborative groups, collaborative partnerships. I know there, there's, there, there's one organized here uh, in the Roaring Fork Valley that's been, um, that's been exploring a lot of different options uh, about restoration. Uh, and, and a lot of what we do is really working with those collaborative, those stakeholders uh, that are part of these collaborative groups, uh, uh, helping uh, reconstruct historic stand and fire regimes like those tree ring analyses. Uh, we, a big chunk of our work is really around um, working with groups to monitor treatments, monitor conditions, going out and, and assessing ecological conditions. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we've worked with some local high schools over on the western slope to bring their biology classes into the field uh, and, we, and, and we, inv uh, we also do a lot more sort of science um, kind of learning and presentation and those kinds of things um, uh, both in the field and, and sort of in meeting settings. This is a lot more fun than this, <laughs> as you can imagine. We, we, we spent a lot of time here talking about uh, out here. Okay. All right, so I want to move, I want to I focus on the, these, uh, this sort of gradient and talk about the disturbance uh, ecology and, and sort of what we know at this point, our current available science uh, about uh, what's happening to those forests. Okay, so lower Montane, uh, sort of the six to 7,500 uh, foot elevation, ponderosa pine dominated, Frequent low intensity surface fires, or, or what we call passive crown fires. This is a great example of what, of what a, a, a sort of a normal fire in Ponderosa Pine looks like. Uh, in terms of its structure and composition, typically op very open forest conditions with clumps of interspersed, clumps of trees interspersed with grasses, forbs, uh, uh, shrubs, and, those, and, and understory plants. So generally pretty open forest conditions. However, as a result of especially settlement era logging and grazing, all that's changed. 
Okay? Stands are, are more dense. Uh, we've also kept fire out of those, uh, those areas. Up to 20 return intervals are missing. Um, uh, uh, my Peter Brown, who works with CFRI a lot, he, he's a dendrochronologist, and, he, and, he, and uh, he talks about the, the amount of photosynthetic energy that's built up as a result of missing 20 intervals. Okay. So there's a threat of uncharacteristically large, severe wildfires, meaning that the ecological restoration need is high. Right? The system is behaving differently, and it is losing properties and in the, in the event of Hayman fire, it's lost properties to be able to, to, to behave like it normally does. It's now behaving very differently. I have a slide to show that. This is a great time series photo uh, that uh, Merrill Kaufman, who's now retired research station, a Rocky Mountain Research Station with the Forest Service, um, uh, dug up. Um, actually, no, I think this is Tom Veblen, who's a professor at uh, University of Colorado. Uh, but in 1896, uh, you can sort of see the, the, stand, the, the forest structure and composition compared to 2000. Right? This is a legacy of fire suppression pretty much exclusively. Trees are allowed to grow. And you know what? We like trees, right? Our vision of, tree, of, of a forest is trees. The more trees, the better. Well, not always, okay? Not, not when then, this is, this is the, the, one, of the smoke, one of the smoke plumes of the Hayman fire. There were several smoke plumes. And, and what happens when you get plumes like that is that fires create their own weather. They create their own low pressure systems that start sucking oxygen out of neighbor, neighboring areas and they basically generate their own sort of heat mountain. That, that, that actually, this, this, this column actually went 60,000 feet up into the stratosphere and got into the jet stream. That's, see, that's energy, right? That's all the, that's, that's 100 years of the sun being released in one fire event. That's, that's how you can think of it. Okay. These, areas, these areas burned by the Hayman fire, uh, there are areas burned by the Hayman fire that have been slow to regenerate, even 10 years later. This is 10, this is, this is 10 years, nearly 10 years, uh, taken uh, last fall. Usually, can you remember that picture of Yellowstone where all those green shoes are popping up? I mean, there's a couple of, I think these are even weed species, plants. There's nothing growing there. There's, no, there's not even a seed source. There's not even a substrate to hold seeds. Okay. That's not what we, ha we may have expected under a normal fire regime. Okay. That's why there's a huge restoration imperative on the front range. There's a lot of resources, a lot of human energy going into making sure Hayman doesn't happen again. Uh, the, and this is the work, that, and this kind of work is being done through what's called the Front Range Roundtable. The roundtable is composed of local, state, federal, state, and local governments, community organizations, uh, conservation organizations, uh, groups like mine, researchers, uh, homeowners associations that are really trying to um, uh, work on these priority areas. These, these green are the restoration priority areas. And if you remember that big cloud of red lightning strikes, they're, they're, that, that, that makes it a, a, a high priority. Okay? So there's, there's a lot going on there. Um, but there's also a lot of great work. Uh, one uh, project that we're involved in out in western Colorado, uh, if you keep driving west to where we are, we cross over McClure Pass, you drop down in the delta, and this is the Uncompagre Plateau. Uh, the Uncompagre Plateau is composed of, um, of, of that elevation gradient, and a lot of that low elevation uh, ponderosa pine is also in need of treatment. Uh, here's the, the set of partners that are part of that. Again, uh, federal, state, and local governments, uh, Western Area Power, a local community, public lands partnership group, uh, the local conservation uh, uh, coalition, Western Colorado Congress, the timber company there, off-highway vehicle users. So it's a real multi-interest sort of interest collaborative project. And again, what, a lot of what we do is really work with those stakeholders to, to sort of build their science, their ecological literacy. That's, that's exactly the term that we use uh, so that they are informed about the kind of restoration needs. Okay, and this is just sort of some pictures of some of the field work that we've done uh, with, uh, with, with these groups. Um, 
we, uh, CFRI then analyzes the data. Uh, this is sort of a, a map, what we call a stem map of the historic forest structure. That might have been at 1875, um, much more sparse, those openings that we saw. Um, and, uh, it, you know, the, the collaborative discussion really evolved around um, the report that we generated and the consensus was we're losing ponderosa pine. That's not a good thing. Uh, we're losing the meadows that allow fires to carry out low intensity and we're losing aspen. So there was a, a restoration, it was a science and a social consensus to do restoration work. And, and what that looks like is doing both mechanical removal of a lot of those small diameter trees and then putting fire back on the ground. These systems want to burn. They have to burn. Okay. So that's what we're doing. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a federal program called the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. It's a national competitive funding program. Uh, and here in Colorado, both in the Front Range and the Uncompahgre receive funding every year to implement those restoration projects. Um, and so if you're interested in that, uh, there's the website of the Forest Service. I won't uh, spend any more time on that. I want to move up to the upper montane. This is, this is my favorite forest type. I love this because it's so complex. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very uh, dynamic and diverse system, what we call warm, dry, mixed conifers. Uh, and the mix typically is ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, maybe some white fir, uh, a lot of aspen, a lot of oaks, um, typically found at these sort of these mid elevations. Um, we think there's not a lot of science actually on the mixed conifer. We think that there's longer return intervals, typically just because we see a much more complex forest structure. Um, that longer interval than the lower montane, certainly. We have mixed severity fires, insects, and diseases. We think they disturb typically between 35 and 75 years. Sort of that, and that's a pretty big range. So we don't know a lot. But what we do know is that there's a lot of variability. The, the size of the patches, the different structures and compositions, and this is kind of what they look like. Um, out on the front range, as well as here in west, southwestern Colorado, very kind of mixed, dynamic, uh, some blue spruce, some ponderosa, some dug fir in there. Here's some oak here, some patches of grass. Lots going on, lots of diversity, okay? Very complex, very little scientific research. And the reason for that is because it is complex. Scientists like simple systems. They're easy to explain. You can publish research on it. You can't get published by looking at complex stuff. There's too much going on. Isn't that crazy? All right. It's one of the frontiers of forest ecological research. My, my colleague at, uh, at NAU, Pete Foulet, who, who has done a lot of research, um, uh, he says that this zone is likely to see changes. The, this is where we're going to see a climate signal happening. That's all he'll say. He doesn't know what that signal is going to look like, but we're going to see some changes. Um, one thing that we do know, at least in Colorado, is that, that logging, especially in the 20th century, has simplified a lot of the forest structure. We've taken out a lot of those big ponderosa pine pumpkins, um, and, and as a result, we've lost some of that diversity. Um, Bill Romney, my colleague at CSU, has talked about how, uh, in terms of fires, um, right now, we experience very small fires and very large fires. What we lack are sort of these medium-sized fires. And he, it's kind of the, what he calls the Goldilocks effect. We don't, we, we're losing that middle, kind of that medium-sized uh, fires. They may benefit from more diversity. There may be one to three returns missing. Okay. As a result, the restoration need is, is low to moderate, depending on where you are, especially if you're close to um, urban areas where there's a higher risk of fire. Okay. But it's still a fairly low uh, restoration need. And, and so one of the collaborative groups we're working with is down here out of Pagosa Spring, the Southwest Colorado Mixed Conifer Working Group. Uh, some of the, some of the, the work that they've already done uh, for thinning and burning, and, and this is courtesy of, of Pete uh, at NAU. Uh, it's a project called the Middle Mountain Project, where they, they remove some trees and they let some fires burn. And it looks great to me. 
you know, a lot of people see the burnt trees. I see the green grass. I think this is really great. This adds a lot of diversity. We're going to increase a lot more uh, chances for the system to get to, to have the things it needs to be able to survive bigger fires. Okay. Kept a lot of the big old trees, took out a lot of the smaller trees, allowed a lot more of this, this kind of patchiness. Okay. Uh, restoring some mixed severity fire back into the system, good for Ponderosa. Um, some areas burn uh, uh, pretty hot, um, but that's kind of what we would expect in, uh, in mixed conifer. Now we get up into the subalpine, and this is, this is, uh, this is where the, the, um, a lot of big changes we're seeing. These are the cool, moist, uh, where we have lodgepole, um, as, lodgepole with aspen, lodgepole with spruce fir, and pure spruce fir. Uh, variable sizes of patches, variable structure and conversation. But what we do know is that they are infrequently disturbed, and when they are disturbed, they are disturbed with very high severity. Okay, they are stand replacing, typically at, at, at intervals of 100 to plus years. Um, I have uh, on the back table uh, some, some paraphernalia, but one of them is a historic range of variability analysis for this part of Colorado going into northern New Mexico. We call it the Central Highlands. And, and, and it talks about these disturbance regimes, so help yourself with those. When we talk about, when we talk about especially the mountain pine beetle and, and sort of the, 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 the newspaper and the, and the media sort of um, coverage of that, you would think that all lodgepole are the same. And I'm here to tell you that they're not. Okay? This is sort of a classic pure lodgepole pine stand, right? Even age, single story, and very little diversity. It's all lodgepole. That's, that's common, but it's not that common. We actually, with the problem, we don't actually don't have data about what the proportion is. Okay. There's a lot of lodgepole with persistent aspen. Maybe you've seen that when you've gone hiking. The, these systems will just kind of cycle between aspen and lodgepole, we think. There's a, there, and, and they're not large areas, but they're important parts of the diversity of that landscape. A much more common lodgepole system is lodgepole mixed with subalpine fir and Engelmann spruce. That's what we typically have here in, 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 in a lot of parts of Colorado. And then you have pure subalpine fir and Engelmann spruce. Right? Messy, messy forests. And messy is good in this context. Right? Lots, of, lots of dead stuff, but lots of living stuff. There's lots of, lots of niches going on. So large-scale high severity mortality is what we would expect. It's an ecologically normal part of the range of disturbances. Return intervals are likely unaffected. There's been, there's been multiple research projects done by, by folks at the University of Wyoming, Colorado State, and the University of Colorado that says fire suppression has not, not impacted uh, uh, fire return intervals in lodgepole pine in the Rocky Mountains. We're not missing any intervals. We're getting close, but we're not missing them. Okay? No evidence of missing properties. These systems are recovering. They're, they're doing pretty well. So the, the restoration, the ecological restoration need is there is, no, there is no restoration need. There may be social priorities and risks to manage for, and I'll, and I'll get to that. Okay? Because there's people, right? But that's a social priority, not an ecological one. Okay, and so, so moving to uh, the, our collaborative map, uh, some of the work we've done with the Colorado Bark Beetle Cooperative. Uh, this is a project uh, to sort of get at um, where are those areas where there might be some social priorities um, where we would want to maybe reduce some hazards. Okay, and this was a, what we call it was a zone of agreement project. Zone, Sloan, were you part of that? Would, yeah, Sloan was part of that. And there was, there was a small group of us that were sort of put together um, by the Governor's Forest Health Advisory Council. And we sort of went through just a, a, very, uh, a very short, simple process to identify uh, where, um, uh, where we wouldn't want to see work done in wilderness areas, in roadless areas, and slopes over, the, over 40%. We do want to be concerned about um, areas where there's water supplies, water intake facilities, diversion facilities that uh, in the event of a, a fire, um, those would be uh, things that we would not want uh, to be at risk. Uh, transmission lines, 
Um, there were some wildlife quarters, although the, the, there, was, there was the impression that the, the, the mountain pine beetle infestation is actually a, a net positive for wildlife. It's creating a lot more diversity. And there's another publication back there that talks about that. The main point of this was to, to, to really get strategic about where to invest those limited resources. Okay, where are the areas that are most important? Uh, and so we identified those with those little colored dots. The ones with the blue lines was, was a, um, a, a priority zone project that was done back in 2007. And there was some pretty good overlap. Not 100%, but there was some pretty good overlap. So uh, that's something that, that we did at, I don't think it went anywhere, Sloan, as I recall. We, it kind of just got put on the shelf. Yeah. But it's a Yeah. What, what we could do. What we could continue to do. No, we're, we're not done with it. Um, some other things that we've brought to the Colorado Bark Beetle Cooperative, uh, my colleague Chuck Rhodes at the Rocky Mountain Research Station um, made, made, has made uh, a couple of presentations to the Bark Beetle Cooperative. Uh, some of the research that he's showing uh, about uh, forest regeneration after pre-outbreak and then post-outbreak. Uh, lodgepole pine, subalpine fir, and Engelmann spruce. And, and as you can see, after the outbreak, um, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of trees, 1,000 trees per hectare coming up. Right? So it's not a dead forest. Lots of good regeneration coming up. And there's inherent structural and compositional diversity. The, the beetles are actually creating a much more diverse ecosystem. So, so um, and, and it shows us that these lodgepole systems are fairly resilient. Right? They, don't, they don't need a lot of our human help to move along. They're doing, they're doing pretty well on their own. It just looks scary, right? It just kind of freaks people out to see all these dead trees on the landscape. Okay. Um, so one of the big concerns is fire. Um, this is a study area that, that I and some, some colleagues at the research station, um, uh, Greg Apple with the Wilderness Society, we're kind of we're just putting in some study areas. This was an area that burned uh, back in 2010. This is high severity stand replacing burn near Fraser, Colorado. Um, and uh, it burned through lodgepole pine mixed with subalpine fern, Engelmann spruce. Um, uh, there was basically no trees living after this. But even a year afterwards, look at all this, look at all this great understory development coming up. Um, even after a, a, a season of snow melt, very heavy snow, and rain, uh, we, didn't see a lot, we hardly saw any soil loss. So these systems, unlike the systems on the front range, they hold soil really well. And the reason why is when we started digging down, there was, there was like 10 inches of like root mat organic matter. Why? Because these systems don't disturb, right? They just kind of, they drop the needles and they, and they just kind of chug along for like 120 years. And all that just gets absorbed up in the soil. So there was very little soil loss, even though it was a big, severe, nasty fire. So, we're, we're okay. I mean, so we, you know, that's what, that's what science is good for. It kind of, we take sort of, you know, speculation and myths, and we say, well, is that true or not? Okay. Um, there, there is some research, uh, and, 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 and Sloan and I are sort of part of this email list, and there's been some back and forth over the last couple of days over this, um, about the kind of fire that we might expect to see. Uh, in, in pure lodgepole, this is why species composition and structure is important. In pure lodgepole, there's very little to, to no crown fire risk, right? Because there's, there, there's, there's, there's not a lot of that structural diversity. At least this is what, these are studies using computer models. That's one thing I will, I will say. And for mixed conifer forests, well, the ones with the spruce and the, uh, and the subalpine fir, there is actually a, a slightly higher risk of surface and crown fire spread just because you have subalpine fir, especially their crowns go all the way to the ground. And so when they, when they, when, if there is a fire that starts, boy, those, those suckers can really go. And that was the source of this fire, was, was a jeep 
We, it, it, it started off the side of the road, so it was either a cigarette butt or a spark or something. Got into some grass, moved up through some spruce fir, and then by the time it got into the lodgepole, it was already a pretty big fire. The lodgepole itself didn't really contribute to a lot of the fire behavior. It just kind of sat there and burned. Um, so there's a lot of computer models. They don't model dead lodgepole very well. I personally have learned to like not even pay attention to computer model-based research. There's just so many assumptions that they get wrong in the complex system. I think they're interesting to think about, but um, I wouldn't, um, it, it, there's, there's, we just have to be careful about um, their, their results. I'm almost done. Do forests possess properties that allow them to retain their essential structure and functioning in the event of future disturbance? All right, so now we're, now we're sort of thinking about, okay, um, what might we infer from what we already know about the past? Okay, so one, uh, there, there are three major climate change models uh, that, 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 that sort of scientists um, kind of use. And they're, now they're in the process of sort of downscaling those models into regional climate uh, prediction uh, forecasts. And maybe you'll hear a lot about them in your next Naturalist Nights presenter. Um, but one of the things that we're hearing is that we're going to be warmer and we're going to be drier. Um, and so let's look back. We, we've had warmer, and well, we don't know about warm, but we certainly have had drier periods in our time. Okay? So what might, what might we know about those? Well, one of the things we ought to be probably investing is using these remaining relic forests to help us understand what we might expect. So that's why, that's why protecting old growth is important. It's not, I love old growth because they look great and you know, they're, they're beautiful and everything, but they also, they also hold really important knowledge. Okay. So one of the things I think might be kind of a cool project for citizen science, scientists to do is to start mapping those areas. Mapping those areas where you, where you, you think you, you, there are you know, these 400 year old to, to more older trees. Because that tells you a lot about the climate conditions. Because the climate 400 years ago, right here, it was very different. And it may actually be a, a more uh, consistent reference point for where we're heading. Okay. Well, the good news is we, we, we had forests back then, right? We had these big old pondos. Here's an interesting study. Um, this was done by some, uh, some folks in California from the, from the uh, Southwest, Southern, uh, Pacific Southwest uh, Research Station um, that, that are modeling climate change uh, impacts um, on, on forest uh, composition and structure in the Sierra Nevadas. Okay, this, goes, this is kind of busy, so I'll, I'll sort of walk you through it. If you sort of look at this one, this is from 2020 to 2049. And then this is 2070 to 2099. Apparently between 2050 and 2069, nobody really cared about that. <laughs> and then what you see here are the forest types, alpine, subalpine, sort of what we considered sort of, right, your lodgepole, subalpine fir, spruce, evergreen conifer forest, that's kind of your mixed conifer, you know, your pines and your, and your, your true firs and your false firs. Mixed evergreen forests are, are both conifer forests as well as hardwood types. In California, they have a lot of oak, manzanita, kind of, they're, they're, there's a lot of hardwood mixed in. Uh, mixed evergreen woodland, uh, it's, it's kind of the same but more sparse, more interspersed with meadows, and then grassland, shrubland, and desert. And then this is percent change from zero. So here's the zero line, here's the percent change. So uh, from, from 2020 to 2049, they're predicting a, a, a fairly large decrease in alpine and subalpine fur. And if you actually go out to 2099, uh, it's nearly 100% based on their climate model, okay? You do see a growth in the mixed evergreen. This kind of system, right? Warm drought-tolerant, fire-resistant forests. Ponderosa, thick-barked forests, okay? That's, that is where we're seeing, and then grassland. 
Okay? We're going to look, uh, so, so, so at least that part of California is going to look a lot like northern Arizona. Northern Arizona is, is going to look like um, a lot of what you see driving up the Roaring Fork Valley, pinyon juniper, woodland, to, to grassland, and, and maybe desert encroachment. Here in Colorado, um, I sort of dug around to see if, if, if anybody had done a similar thing. No, one, no one's done that for us yet. So um, that's, that's a frontier research that might be kind of cool to do. Um, Again, you know, I, I'm not, I, you know, I love computers and iPhones and stuff like that as much as anybody else. But these computer simulations, there is so much uncertainty and error built in. Uh, apparently, the models do pretty well until about 2020. And then they just fall apart. And yet, and I know this because my buddy Paul Evangelista, he's, he's an old fishing buddy of mine. We, we hang out a lot and we collaborate on research a lot. Uh, we're working on a project uh, um, on, on mountain pine beetle recovery. Um, so he, he's one of these people that run these models. And he's just like, man, Tony, beyond 2020, all bets are off. And I'm like, well, how do you guys get published? <laughs> right? And he's just like, because science, right? Science is the big, that's, that's the gold standard. If you get published in science, man, you can retire. You get tenured, you can retire as an academic. But science is publishing this stuff. Like this, this paper by Westerling, well, this is, actually, this is actually a good paper. This is based on real data. Uh, but this is, uh, seriously, this paper, uh, and the, these people are eminent. Jerry Franklin, P. Foulet, Tom Veblen. These guys are eminent scientists. And I look at this study, and they talk about widespread decrease, increase of tree mortality rates in the western U.S. based on these climate change models. And they're talking about, like, lodgepole pine shrinking down to 17% of its range. I'm like, where are you getting this from? And they can't, they, it was, that's what the model says. So, again, they're interesting. They're something that we have to think about. But please don't treat them as truth. Right? They're just, they're, they, they are just an artifact of a computer model. Okay. So that's, that's my thing. I, I use models too, so um, I'm not, not bashing them. But uh, at any rate, this, this is an interesting paper too. I, I, I have a whole section, selection of papers I wasn't going to show you. Um, and, and this one looks especially at the distribution of pine beetles under current and future climate scenarios in the, in the Mountain West. And they actually show that in some places in Colorado that, that there's actually a decrease in beetle activity because the, species, the, the tree species are going to change so much that those beetles, like mountain pine beetles, don't, you know, don't really infest uh, uh, big stands of like ponderosa pine. So, so there's going to be different host species and they're different bugs. So anyway. Um, interesting paper, um, if you can kind of get through all of the scientific mumbo-jumbo. All right, so my, my, this is my last slide. Um, Take-home messages, I got five. Acknowledge and appreciate change. We, we, are li we, are, you, you, we should actually somewhat be privileged to be witnessing some pretty profound changes. Um, uh, so that's one way to look at it. <laughs> Um, include, and so if you're, if you're interested in, in learning and, and taking action and finding out what action, be inclusive. Include and leverage the resources of multiple entities. Be expansive. Not every, no one entity has the solution or the answer or even the right questions. I, I'm always appreciative of interacting with different people with different perspectives because I get to ask different questions. And we try to do that with our collaborative groups here in Colorado. Um, this is my big one. Invest in co-producing. Co-producing with these partners locally relevant, actionable knowledge using valid methods. Okay? Don't just speculate. Go out and measure. There's no substitute for that. And, and, and what you measure will then be locally relevant. You don't have to rely on computer models 
or, or general, generalized scientific research, you can actually generate your own knowledge about your own places. Uh, this, really talks of, this really gets to that place-based focus. You gotta, you gotta have real data about the forest you're working in. And get into the forest. But if there's any Forest Service people here, I would say check, the sa check safety first. <laughs> it's, uh, they are, they are, these are unsafe conditions. Um, uh, under, the, un, under very low winds, these trees are falling down at pretty high rates. So uh, monitor. One of the things that we don't do very well that, that our ancestors did very well is we kept track of what's going on out there. Okay? And the, a lot of you might, might spend a lot of time in a place and you've probably seen changes to those places. That's monitoring. Okay? We can, those are simple things we can do. Uh, uh, do. Doing these photo series I think is one of the easiest things you can do and it's a great way to involve kids. Right? Great way to involve like high school, junior high kids, and you get a class and they go out and they take a picture of the same place year after year after year. And over the years, they can start seeing changes in their own backyard. It's very cool. Um, we like to invest in permanent plots. And, and, and what those basically mean is they're GPS. These are, these are areas that we can go back to over and over again. And we just take the same measures over and over again on those plots. They're not very expensive. They're not very hard to do. There's also a lot of existing uh, data and databases that federal agencies actually collect. I'm actually surprised at how much data our agencies actually have, and, but, but uh, aren't always used. Okay. Uh, so uh, one way is to leverage your local schools, colleges, and universities to, to help out with that. Right? And that's, that gets back to this co-producing, locally relevant knowledge. Okay? Empower yourselves. Uh, and then prioritize those areas where agreement is high. That's where, you, that's where including uh, all the right partners is important. If you get agreement is high and you're able to achieve multiple values, then you get the best use of limited resources. Pretty simple, but that's... Um, that, that is the best way to sort of address a lot of the values we have as a society about our forests. So that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. How about we'll start in the back here. I have a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I read an article about sudden decline. Yes. Rate. Yeah. So the question is um, uh, about the sudden aspen decline and the and the aspen die off and and um, some art, recent articles attributing it to long term drought um, and and there and, and is that a, is that the reason why and um, in preparation for this presentation I read up on some of these articles and yes that is the case and where we, where we typically see sudden aspen decline uh, and and uh, so the, the acronym is SAD. Um, and the reason why it's sudden and it's declining is because that, that aspen typically are very hardy. When, they, when, when a big mama tree dies, about a thousand baby trees pop up from the roots. They're, they're extremely resilient. And, and so you, you, can, you, can, you can beat the snot out of aspen and it'll just keep coming back. But the thing is, there are some areas where that's not happening. Those, the mama trees are dying and there's no babies coming up. Okay. And, and typically those are at lower elevations and southern exposure slopes. Jim Worrell is a, for, is, a, is a forest health researcher at a, what's called the Gunnison Forest Health Center. And, um, and Jim has sort of I typologized that where he generally sees SAD is below a certain elevation and in southern slopes. And that's where we're seeing that kind of dry, droughty, conditions. And so there is a drought signal that's pushing those up. So one of the, one of the hypotheses is if you, we go back to right here, 
where you, where a lot of a, a, um, a lot of those a lot of the aspen that are down low might have actually popped up in these wetter periods. They took advantage. They're, they're very aggressive. They're fast growing. You know, it, within about three years, you can have a 15 foot tall aspen. Right? They just grow like crazy. And so in wet, in wet, sort of favorable conditions, they'll just come in and take over. And when it dries out, they'll recede. They're, so a lot of that sad may be occurring at the lower extent of their elevation and at the latitude. But is the actual tree complex dying yeah. all the way back? Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, so one of the things is that uh, that they're that they're thinking about is that um, you know so you have uh, uh, so trees um, evapotranspirate, right? The, the the they have stoma in their leaves that that draw up water and then evaporates through the through the leaves and 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 help out with the photosynthesis. Because of drought, the 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 cambial layer isn't holding turgor pressure. So what, you're, what basically is happening is that the stoma are closing and you have a collapse of the water column. You're done, right? You can't, if you're not photosynthesizing, you're done as a tree. And, and because that's happening across the entire tree system to its roots, the, the entire water column is collapsed within those trees. Thank you. Yeah. So, follow up on that. Should we be doing something to preserve those stands of aspen that are retreating and as, as these south facing lower elevation sites are drying up? Well, even if you wanted to, I don't know if you could get them to grow there. Right? I mean, it's just, it's just a function of physics and biology. We're not running, you know, so, you know, we're not, Aspen is an endangered species. We're, so there may be a particular stand of Aspen that is near and dear to people's heart that, um, that um, may be, you know, may be losing that, um, uh, that people would want to see some action. But um, unless you're going to put out sprinkler systems and those kinds of things, right, we can do those things. We can preserve... We can preserve the kinds of forests we want to preserve, but we, we have to put in a lot of energy. We have to put in a lot of inputs. You know, I, I, I recently read um, you know, some articles uh, in the newspaper about um, hanging verbenone packets on, on, on lodgepole pine trees around some areas of, uh, of aspen because they're high, you know, people want to protect those. Um, well, that's, that's a lot of energy. It, it's a social value to preserve those trees, but those, you know, it's, it may sound trite to say this, but those trees are meant to die. Again, it's, it sounds trite, but that, the, those systems, that's, that's how they are functioning. And it may actually be an ecologically abnormal thing to keep them alive. It's kind of like life support. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, and that's a human, that's a human thing, right? We, we have these, these emotional attachments to, you know, trees and forests and those kinds of things. And um, so, I, you know, I mean, I understand that, but we also have to understand sort of fundamental limits of biology and ecology. And if we want to exceed those limits, we, we, ha we humans have to put in a lot of energy to do that. I, I have a friend who's a, a professional forester. Mm -hmm. And he and, and, and a partner just won a contract with the Lakota Sioux up in South Dakota um, to, to train many of the, the, a lot of the, the local men there to take down the, the people killed trees. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Is, is taking down the trees a good idea or not? <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, the... the um, the question was, um, is, is taking down the dead uh, lodgepole pine trees a, a good idea? And uh, again, it's what, what values you're trying to promote. If you are trying to promote um, reducing hazards to, um, you know, to the public, 
for you know, roadways and power lines and, and hiking trails and those kinds of things, then yeah, you don't want the, that liability on your hands, right? But again, those systems are, uh, that, that's part of the reorganization process after this release is to create those conditions for the next forest. And so, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm not in a position to judge other people's decisions because they, they may have values for doing that. And so I, I don't want to get into a situation where it's good or bad. From a solely ecological perspective, the more, you know, and so getting back to the prior question about, um, you know, preserving aspens that are, di that are dying or preserving a lodgepole, what you're doing is you, you, are, you are holding the system up here. And what we know from, from systems ecology is that if you want to keep a system in conservation, you have to put more and more energy. You have to build up more and more energy. It's all about calories. And at some point, those systems, the, the natural variability of systems is that they're going to release. They're going to release those calories. You can't, you can't hold living systems back from changing. Um, now, for, as far as removing the trees, um, there, yeah, I mean, there, there may be some legitimate social values for doing so. Uh, I, I would want to be, uh, be aware, uh, you know, make sure that the, there's minimal soil disturbances. There's minimal disturbance to all the other properties that allow this system to reorganize. Soil is the biggest one. One more question. Yes. Yeah. The, so the comment is that that the Forest Service has made a decision that they're not going to be doing a lot of the dead tree removal only in the situations where there's broad social agreement around hu human safety and those kinds of things. Yeah. 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 And, there, and, and that's where you, you really are trying to balance risks. You know, there, and so you know, there, are, there are certainly going to be risks to humans uh, and, and property and infrastructure if you leave those trees up. But then by going in and removing those trees, are you perpetuating a different kind of ecological risk? And, 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 and in a lot of places, we make those decisions, right? We say, you know, the loss of life, the loss of the ability of water companies, um, east slope water companies that are pilfering western slope water, so maybe you guys don't really care. <laughs> but um, uh, they, they, they do, they, any risk is unacceptable to them. And so they will just do it in, in order, to, in order to, to manage their water treatment areas. And, and, but in, in most carries, cases, probably, you know, 80% of the landscape, yeah, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sort of do its natural thing. So we're going we're gonna to watch that happen. Thank you for your attention and uh, allowing me to ramble. Thank you, Tony. And, and so for the purposes of gratitude to you, we have some closure here. Uh, but you don't have to leave, and we don't have to stop talking. So thank you, Tony. I'm a lot smarter now than I was an hour ago. And I hope you guys are as well. <laughs> yeah, we can keep this going. Uh, be, yeah. So thanks.